This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, you guys hear me all right? Uh, if, I, if I stop for a breather, it's just because I'm not just presenting how it This is the first time since COVID I've been in person. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I just want to start by saying if you guys have any, I'm an engineer, I'm used to presenting to engineers. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to just interrupt me. Raise your hand. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation to, to ask any questions. So um, just out of curiosity, everyone here is a plant sciences background, horticulture background. So I guess anyone studying viticulture in particular? Okay, well, that's good, <laughs> that's good for me. Uh, so uh, I just want to start by acknowledging uh, Justin Bennett, Google, and Kirsten Peterson, um, who are the, the PIs in this project. And, here we're trying to make sure CETA and uh, NSF. And so, yeah, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick outline of my presentation. I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit about my background and uh, where I'm coming from, and then uh, move into like a motivation and background on uh, the research project itself. And uh, go over a little bit of terminology that's most helpful for the rest of the presentation and talk about like traditional yield uh, prediction methods and why we're interested in improving upon them. Uh, and then from there, I'll, I'll sort of lay out the proposed method that, that we're researching and go over the hardware and software of it and uh, talk about like the results, how we analyze the data, and uh, a little discussion on the significance of it. And of course, if we have time, I also want to um, give you a very, very quick overview of some of the other research that we're doing in viticulture projects and where we want to take uh, the direction of this, of this research. So um, to start out, I actually grew up about 30 minutes from here, right in the heart of the Finger Lake, um, right, uh, let me make sure I can get the place kind of right, Finger Lake, and it's about 30 minutes north of here, and uh, for my first job ever, or for five years, was working um, in uh, a vineyard, Sunrise Hill Vineyard, it was about five minutes from where I grew up to get bikes, um, and so that was my childhood, just going out, tending the vines, and learning how to grow grapes, and uh, after that, I went on to study physics and computer science, and um, and then went to industry and got a job as a systems engineer. No one knows what systems engineering is. That's all right. I came to Cornell and uh, I was fortunate enough to join Kirsten Peterson's lab as a, as a PhD student. Uh, she, she runs the collective embodied intelligence lab. So that's a little bit about me. Um, now, I know you guys are mostly uh, plant science people, so you already have a really good idea of like agriculture and why it's important to study it. Um, but I thought I would just sort of Throw some things out there for you. Like the, the world population is growing and it's growing fast, right? And um, that means that we're going to need more food for uh, to meet to meet uh, uh, hunger needs, right? And uh, particularly, um, we 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 want to work on nutrient-rich foods, right? Things that are going to actually um, help people grow strong and, and uh, uh, you know develop uh, developmentally. Um, and one of the one of the problems with this is that farming over the past 12 years has been um, notoriously like unprofitable. So, so on the one hand, you have increased demand for food, and on the other hand, you have uh, it's becoming less and less profitable to become a farmer, right? And so these these problems are kind of um, are kind of clashing together to to exacerbate things. And so we're left with like a global a global food shortage, right? People are going hungry, um, and so that. This is kind of like the motivation for like why I'm interested in agriculture at all, right? And uh, so, like to give you an overview of robotics and technology in agriculture, a lot of these technologies they start out in the lab, right? Uh, you've got cutting edge like computer vision, machine learning, um, and then, you know, automation things like that. And at some point, um, they have to move out of the lab and into the field, where a farmer can actually use this technology to help them do their job well, right? And that has like a local impact to that farm, right? We can um, help them reduce waste, create higher yields, increase profit margins, uh, things like that. And when you take a bunch of small farms, right, that are all uh, able to have access to this technology and you look at the local impacts, um, when you zoom out, this overall can have a huge global impact, right? And can help meet the, the hunger crisis, increase sustainability, things like that. So um, the area of my research is kind of like right here in the middle. Like how do we get 
the technology out of the lab, all of this great cutting edge stuff that engineers are coming up with, how do we get it out of the lab and into the hands of farmers to a point where they can actually use it? They don't need a degree in engineering in order to figure out how to operate the mechanism um, or understand the principles, but we can actually disseminate that technology to uh, help them improve their management process. So um, looking a little bit more closely at like local viticulture, uh, like the great industry in the US is, is pretty big, right? And, and more specifically, it's a very important industry here in New York, not only in like your direct freight sales and, and wine sales, but it brings a tremendous amount of tourism into this area. Like um, my family member, I have, I have a brother-in-law who's a winemaker in this area, like he, his living is from people coming to the Finger Lakes to try local wine, right? And to, and to, and to experience the local uh, vineyard. And one of the challenges is that um, bill prediction is pretty hard, right? Like, just an anecdotal example, in 2016, you had a really big drought. The following year, in 2017, um, most of the yield predictions only accounted for about like two thirds of the final harvest yield. So like people have a really hard time estimating exactly how many grapes they're gonna get at the end of the year, um, which can be really problematic. Um, and so like, why are we interested in predicting yield in vineyards in the first place? And the, the, the short answer is resource value. Right? Like uh, farmers need to secure tank space for grape juice and then they turn it into wine. Uh, they need to secure, you know, bottles, labels, packaging, stuff like that. Um, they also need to uh, secure labor, which can be very difficult. A lot of uh, laborers, like um, uh, migrant, migrant workers, things like that, they need to secure them ahead of time. And uh, they, they secure them for a certain amount of time, like a week or two, right? And if, if it's going to take substantially longer to harvest everything or to clean everything than they initially thought, like, you need to know that kind of thing ahead of time to be able to schedule this kind of stuff. Um, and, and of course, uh, probably one of the most important things is sale and purchase agreements. So like um, every year, uh, vineyards that don't have a winery, they have to find wineries to buy their grapes. And every year, wineries that don't have enough vineyards to make wine for all the wine they're trying to produce, um, they have to uh, find sellers to buy the grapes from. And so, like, they make agreements about how many tons of grapes they're going to buy each year and from who. And, like, knowing ahead of time if you're going to have like 10 tons of grapes from a certain block or 15 tons of grapes from a, from a certain block can make a really big difference when you're trying to grape juice these things from a business standpoint. Um, and the biggest thing here is that, like, uh, like I said before, yield is really hard to predict. And one of the reasons why is because there's a very large amount of fluctuation in the amount of rain that we get in. So like out in California, it's very dry. Everything is irrigated. They can precisely water uh, all of the vines as much as they want. And they can get the same yield every year out of the same amount of uh, acres, right? Up here, like in 2007, we got like eight inches of rain. This is just for the summer months. And then in, in 2021, we got like 25 inches of rain, right? And so like vast differences in the amount of rain can change um, yield pretty tremendously. So it's just like a really hard problem to solve, right? So that's why we're, we're motivated to try and uh, predict yield in vineyards. So I'm just going to go over this pretty quickly. This is a, this is a grapevine. Um, if you hear me talk about shoots, every grapevine has like a trunk uh, that grows up from the ground and then uh, anywhere between two to four canes that run along a wire. And off of those canes, there's a, a vertical growth called a shoot. All of the grape clusters grow directly off of the shoot. Um, so, and then sometimes you'll hear, hear me refer to like a shoot tip. That's like um, early on in the season before the vine grows to its full capacity. The tip of the shoot has this nice light green growth at the end of it that uh, it's pretty, you'll see in some of the pictures that I show later, um, that's pretty easy to recognize and pick out. So I'm just going to be referring to shoots and clusters and shoot tips. I just um, wanted you guys to have an understanding for, for what I'm talking about. So this is just another picture of like um, the way that these are the, the canes is anywhere between two to four, depending on how, how healthy the vine is, and the, the shoots grow off of the canes and the clusters grow off of the canes. So, um, how do we estimate yield in a vineyard? And uh, I promise there's not a lot of math in this, this talk. This is, this is about the extent of it. Um, like the estimate in tons and tons, tons of grapes, if you will, is just like the number of grape clusters in the vineyard times the average weight of each grape cluster. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, no, no farmer is going to count the total number of grape, grape clusters in their entire vineyard because that's just 
kind of ridiculous. So what we do instead is we break this term into two terms, and we talk about like the average number of grapes per vine, and then multiply that by the estimated number of vines in the space, right? And so there's sort of two factors, if you will. Um, the total number of vines in the vineyard is pretty well known or understood. Like um, you can even do this on a panel by panel basis, which would be like a group of three or four vines between a post. Um, and so like the two main factors that farmers are always trying to figure out when, when estimating the yield is this one right here, which is like the number of grape clusters per vine or per panel and the weight of each grape cluster. Um, pretty straightforward stuff, right? So this project is focused on only estimating that first term, the total number of grapes in the vineyard. Um, we, we have other ways of estimating the average grape cluster. Uh, you can use historical data, right? How much did each grape cluster weigh last year? Um, phase lag method involves like looking at uh, how heavy the grape is at a certain point in the, of the growth, state, uh, growth cycle and then using that to extrapolate. Uh, growing degrees, the method actually accounts for like weather and sunlight and stuff like that. Um, there's methods to do this. I'm sure there's room for improvement, but that's not where I'm focused on right now. What I'm focused on right now is estimating um, the number of grape clusters per vine, actually more specifically the total number of grape clusters in the vineyard. Um, because farmers, they estimate the average number of grape clusters per vine by manually counting all of the grape clusters on like a subset of the vines in the vineyard, right? And they calculate an average and they call it good enough. Of course, this has some problems because um, the accuracy of this estimation is going to, the, the amount of data that you, the amount of vines that you have to count in order to get an accurate average is going to scale with the size of the vineyard, right? If you've got a small 12 acre vineyard, you might be able to get away with counting 100 vines, right? But if you've got, you know, 120 acre vineyard, that might not be good enough, right? And so one of the problems is like, how much data is enough data to give yourself a good estimation? There's also other problems, and this can be expensive, right? So if you have a large vineyard, you're gonna have to count a larger subset. There's also this, this issue of like vine selection bias, which can be kind of challenging because uh, the robustness of a vine is gonna depend a lot on like where it is in the vineyard. So if you've got like a little valley where all of the rain settles and the nutrients uh, and soil sediment kind of like settles in that valley, where you might have like six or seven vines that are really full and really robust. And then uh, and then, you know, like a couple feet away, you'll have these little scrawny vines that don't have the same nutrients, right? And so you can imagine that if you selected just only the healthy vines, you're going to have, a, you're going to way overestimate an average number of grape clusters per vine and vice versa, right? So like selecting the right subsample of vines is really difficult. And this last one is huge. It's counter error. Um, people are, are very unreliable at consistently counting the number of grape clusters per vine. And we, I'll show you that uh, in a bit. Oh, this is just a picture of like the vines. And um, it's kind of actually hard to see the grape clusters. You can't count them by just sort of walking by and looking at them. You have to like put your hands in the vine, touch every single shoot of which there are hundreds on a single vine. You have to figure out exactly how many grape clusters are on that shoot. And you can't double count and you can't undercount, right? It's really hard to do this. Uh, that's why that's why like um, manual counting can be so unreliable. So just to illustrate how unreliable manual counting can be, we took data over uh, three years. Uh, in 2020, we just had one person count. Those, those are the yellow dots. So um, on the x-axis here, we have the harvest counts. The harvest counts are considered like the sort of the ground truth, if you will, the most reliable count of how many grape clusters are actually in the vineyard. The reason why is because when you're harvesting, you're going through and you're cutting off each grape cluster by hand, you're counting it and putting it in a bin. You can't double count because once you cut it off, you can't count it again, right? It's no longer on the vine. And hopefully you're not missing any grape clusters when you harvest. So that's why you can do the harvest count sort of like the ground proof. Um, and so what we have here are hand counts that were taken in early June. Um, like you can see this person who counted with the yellow dots, they had a relatively straight line um, with some variance. They had a pretty high R2 value. R2 is just like, you know, how well it all fits um, to the line. Meaning like this person in 2020 did a fairly good job. If you look at the two counters that we've had in 2019, um, they kind of just, 
it almost looks like they randomly picked the number. You know what I mean? There's not there's not much of like a line here to speak of. Uh, and you can even see that, like the R2 value fit for, for these years. So like, and and this is the difference between, you know, like a highly motivated grad student from, from the analogy department who's working with us doing a really good job. And like some summer interns that, you know, like it's just really inconsistent about like how well someone's going to do when it comes to science and science. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so I also just want to touch base on this real quick. We, we also threw, threw around the idea of instead of counting grape clusters um, themselves, what if we counted the shoots, use the number of shoots as a proxy, kind of hoping that it would be easier to find a consistent, uh, it would be easier to find the average number of grape clusters per shoot and then count the shoots then on each vine than it would be if you find the average number of grape clusters per vine. Hopefully that makes sense. And the reason why is because like, if you just sort of plot the average number of clusters and the average number of shoots, you do get a really a relatively nice fitting line. So I'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, these two graphs are just to illustrate we have one counter count all of the all of the clusters and shoots out of on a set of vines. And we had another counter go back and recount them. And if they got the same count, you would expect a nice straight line. And what we haven't said is that the two different people got two very different numbers when asked to count. So just trying to illustrate exactly how hard and uh, difficult it is to um, manually count it. It's just unreliable. You can't trust it. So the question is, can we improve upon this trust, right? Uh, and the way we do that, hopefully, is by like reducing the amount of uh, counting that people have to do. Like, if you know that you have to count a, a thousand vines, and you're going to do it very quickly. You're probably not going to do a very good job. If you know that you only have to count ten vines, right, or twenty vines. I kind of it's going to change your approach. You can be much more precise. You can take your time. You know more accurate count. Um, and of course, if you're counting less, you're reducing the amount of time that you have to pay somebody to count, which means you're saving money. Um, and so, can we create a system that that will reduce the amount of manual counts you have to do? It'll it'll be low cost, easy to use, right? We can't we can't have anything that a farmer wouldn't be able to operate after using like a simple manual. Um, and ultimately, will perform better than the traditional method of counting, right? So um, that's why I want to propose this new computer vision method, uh, which is basically just a smartphone attached to a tractor, um, or uh, or or it could be walk through the vineyard. So, so basically, what we have here is this uh, a smartphone. The camera is pointing at the at the vines, and it automatically counts the number of grape clusters, and then we just Count manually count a small subset of the vines in order to calibrate them to make sure that we're not that we can account for any occlusion or like great clusters that we can't see. Um, and it's actually really cheap to do, right? Most people already any smartphone made after 2016 probably has a camera good enough to be able to implement this. Uh, and so we need some lights that cost fifty dollars, uh, some batteries, and a stabilizing gim uh, gimbal that you can just like. Pick up from Walmart that cost eighty dollars, right? Like this whole setup, you know, costs under two hundred dollars, and um, hopefully improves upon the the, the 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 methods. And so I'll get into that in a bit. Do you have any questions? I just want to. Okay, cool. Um, so here's just an example of how it's set up. This is an ATV, uh, which is a tripod. There's a little gimbal right here, and there's my there's my phone. My like at this point, six year old phone now, or something like that. It's just a, um, an iPhone 10. Uh, here's another shot of it. You can see we have some LED lights. And here's just an example of the video. Because now, it looks like I'm driving really, really slow. I'm not. I'm driving at a reasonable pace. Um, I took the video in slow motion. And I'll kind of explain why in a bit. Uh, but my camera can do 240 frames per second. Uh, like I said, my phone is relatively old, a couple generations old at this point. So, um, so here's just another diagram kind of like illustrating what we're doing here. Driving through the vines, the camera's up. I record at 240 frames per second. Uh, the reason I do this at night with artificial lighting is because from a computer vision standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, it's a lot easier to create detection algorithms, tracking algorithms that have consistent lighting. Um, you could do this during the day. Uh, and I'm sure that some company would, would take this and Re-implement it to make it work during the day. I just don't have the time to um, create that much training data and fine-tune the algorithm. Uh, it just sort of simplifies things to do it at night. 
A lot of farmers actually like to do their spring at night because the, the winds drop down right around the sunset. Um, so, uh, and then of course, there's just a gimbal that um, when you go over bumps or whatever, the, the gimbal just kind of stabilizes the camera so the camera isn't shaking um, wildly. So that's pretty much the, the, the main thing, but, but this isn't the first computer vision system to attempt to predict yields. So the question is like, why is this different than anything anyone else has done? And a couple of reasons. The first is, it's dirt cheap. Um, there are people who have built stereo machine learning computer vision systems to do something like this. Yeah, they do it a little bit, you know, well, substantially better than, than we do, but they cost $12,000. A farmer growing, you know, 30 acres of grapes is not going to be able to invest $12,000 into an advanced computer vision system when they're only going to be saving themselves maybe five or six grand um, by accurately estimating their yields early on, right? So no specialized hardware, it's a lot cheaper, um, pretty easy to use. All you need is a phone and you need to just find some way to like wrap it to a tractor uh, or even just like hold your phone and walk through your vineyard with that stuff too. Um, and uh, one of the differences here is that we actually look at the vines much earlier than a lot of other yield um, prediction methods do. So we're looking at the vines during uh, Icon uh, Lorenz pages 12 through 15, which are kind of in here, right? So the grape clusters, it's like right before they start to flower, uh, the grape clusters are a little bit bigger than my thumb. They're very small, they're very hard to detect. Um, but the canopy, the leaf area is much thinner. So a lot of other um, people who do this kind of research, they, they kind of cheat. So what they do is they go through and they rip off all the leaves. Um, and I've seen pictures of it in like papers and stuff. And it's just kind of unrealistic. Um, you might do some leaf thinning, but, uh, but, but um, we can just sort of go in, uh, leave the vines as they are. We don't have to artificially like remove leaves in order to make the grape clusters more visible. And uh, we can detect these grape clusters when they're about the size of the uh, sun. So, um, oh, and before burying, burying, you know, just before burying. Uh, so, this is just a quick overview of like the software side of it, like how we analyze the videos. Um, and I'll explain it conceptually and then go into some of the components a bit more just to um, give you guys a bit of a background. So, we start by taking the frames from the video individually. Um, I guess I have a laser thing. We take the frames from, from the video individually and we feed them into like an object detection algorithm. This is what your phone uses or Facebook uses to like detect the face, except instead of trying to detect the face, we detect very clusters. Pretty straightforward. Uh, we take the location of those gray clusters, we pass them into Visual Tracker. Visual Tracker basically can take, um, it can take subsequent frames of a video, and when you put a box around something, it can try to find that object in the next frame um, without, and all it knows is where it was in the previous frame. So it can kind of like follow objects through the video. And what this does is it allows us to not double count vines or double count gray clusters. So, Let's say in one frame we detect um, a grape cluster, and then in the next frame we detect it again. So the visual tracker is going to estimate the position of that grape cluster from the previous frame in the new frame. And when they line up, it'll be like, oh, we already detected that grape cluster. We don't need to detect it again. So then at the end of it, all you have to do is like count the number of trackers you have, and you have an estimate for the number of grape clusters in the row or the panel or the vineyard or whatever it is, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, so this is what it ends up looking like uh, at, the, at the end of it all. You can see there are little boxes being drawn around these grape clusters. Um, they're giving you these numbers, and the algorithm can kind of like follow the grape clusters as they move through the thing, uh, as they move through the shot. Uh, once again, it's moving pretty slowly. That's only because I slowed the video down. This video over here, I am. Um, uh, it's not in slow motion. You can see instead of counting the grape clusters, I'm actually trying to count. The shoot tips instead, right? Hoping that we can use these shoots as a proxy for the number of grape clusters. Uh, so this is this is a bit closer to the actual speed that uh, I was moving with the tractor. Uh, so yeah, this is this is how it performs. Um, now I'm going to go a bit into how the object detection and trackers work. I'm going to keep things as conceptual as possible, but I just want to help you guys understand that like. Object detection, it isn't black magic. It's actually just very basic math. Um, I'm not going to go into the math, don't worry. But I just want you guys to not be like, next time you 
read about object detection, just have an understanding of like what's happening uh, inside the box. So let's see. Okay, so what's a neural network? A neural network is like just a mathematical algorithm. Um, it's made up of a bunch of perceptrons, and this up here is 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 a perceptron. And all a perceptron does is it takes a bunch of numbers that are in a line. It takes each of those numbers, it multiplies them by another number, adds them together, and then once it adds them together, it figures out if the total is bigger or smaller than some threshold. And if it's bigger, the output of that perceptron is a one. If it's smaller, the output of that perceptron is zero. And what this simulates is a neuron in the human brain that has some electrical inputs and decides whether or not to fire like the synapse, right? So what you can do is you can string a bunch of these, like each of these dots here is like its own perceptron. You can string a bunch of these perceptrons together and you get a neural network that mimics brain behavior because all it's doing is um, figuring out based on the inputs whether or not it needs to fire, right? Um, and it isn't, uh, older neural networks used to just sort of be a one or a zero output. Um, we kind of updated them now to have like a scale between one and zero so they can kind of half fire and not fire. And it's like I said, it's just designed to mimic like synapses firing in your brain. You can strengthen synapse connections or weaken synapse connections in order to learn things. So the beauty of this algorithm is that if you give it examples of what you want it to learn, the algorithm can automatically figure out what numbers it needs to multiply by the inputs at each level in order to give you the desired output. Uh, right? So, like I said, it's very powerful because you can just give it examples. I want you to learn how to do. You know, given these sets of inputs, give me that output. You give it a bunch of examples, eventually it just figures it out on its own, just like a real human brain. One of the challenges is that um, it's only designed to take 1D data. Images, of course, are 2D. So the question is, how do we overcome this? And the answer is, instead of coming up with like a line of numbers multiplied by your line of inputs, you basically come up with a square of numbers, like a grid of numbers to multiply by your input. And uh, that way you can just take two dimensional chunks of the image. And do the same thing. Um, we uh, we stop calling them perceptrons at that point. We start calling them bit filters, and we just have cascading filters that act a lot like perceptrons, and they just take chunks of the image, they multiply them by some number, pass them on to the next set of filters, and if you do that enough, you end up with something. This is just sort of a visual representation of what it is. It ends up being like a set of high-level features. When I say high-level features, I mean like edges, corners, curves, waves, color patterns, things like that. It's like, an, it's like a abstraction of what's in the image, except it's kind of spatially corresponding to where that feature is in the image. And then we just take those features, we put them into a regular um, 2D neural network and out pop, uh, you know, you pass in a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog and it says, oh, this one's a cat, this is a dog. Pretty straightforward, right? Hopefully um, that makes sense to you guys. Um, Going to throw one more slide in here, and basically these types of neural networks are called convolutional neural networks. They're really good at classifying an image as what it is, but they're hard at figuring out where on an image something is. And so for that, um, basically what they do is they just put a bunch of um, convolutional neural networks together. They put them together in an order where they one convolutional neural network comes up with features. Another convolutional neural network tries to guess what, what parts of the feature probably have objects in it. And then there's another one over here that just takes each of those proposed locations and determines if it's a good cluster or not. So pretty straightforward. Um, that's how that, that was, uh, that was sort of like this section over here. I'm also just going to briefly explain the diagram to you. I know this image is a bit hard to understand. Uh, I just pulled it from our paper, but I'll explain it to you conceptually. The trackers, basically what they do is they just, um, every time a new frame comes up, we have a, uh, we have a, a bunch of boxes around all of our grid clusters. The tracker just um, extrapolates the previous, the previous grid clusters to the new location, lines them up with the new detections, figures out which ones are the same and which ones are unique and puts boxes around the ones that you haven't detected yet and assigns a number to them. And the ones that we have already detected, it just assigns the old number to that new detection. Does that make sense? And that way we can avoid double counting 
um, and stuff like that. We also throw a few tricks in there to try and figure out what to do when like a grid cluster moves behind the leaf and then comes back out the other side because the tracker can't follow it behind the leaf. So we need some like velocity of calculation, things like that. Um, point being, the tracker basically just tries to maintain the identity of each grid cluster as it comes in and out of the frame. So hopefully that makes sense. And so that's a that's sort of this step right here. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. I, I you guys now understand how all of the computer vision magic works. Um, you know, uh, inside the black box. So uh, here are the, the results, basically. Um, so this graph up here is what I showed you um, before. This is what, what happened when we asked people to go through and manually count all of the grid clusters in every section of the vineyard. And they counted them on a panel by panel basis, which I think is a group of four lines. Um, so each point represents like how many grid clusters are in that group of four. Um, and so, yeah, so up here, you can see over the, over the course of uh, three years, um, sort of like how well they correlated to the actual yield. We also asked them to go through and manually count shoots to see if when they counted shoots, there was a strong correlation to the yield. You can see what's going on there. Now, these two columns over here are basically the same counts, except generated by smartphones, right, uh, instead. So, um, so uh, and here are just the R2 values to see the difference of how strongly they correlate. Um, what basically what we can see is like it's 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 about as good as manual counting, right? Um, the difference is you can do it substantially faster with your phone than you can with um, by hand. But one of the problems we have is that the phone pretty regularly undercounts by a certain percentage. Because there are there's a certain percentage of grade clusters that you can't see on the back side of the line. And so um, the way we uh, the way we overcome that is by um, I'm sorry, this illustrating the, the panel is made out of four lines. Um, we uh, we calibrate them using manual counts. So like um, uh, we have uh, a row, for example, we have a certain count that um, the computer vision uh, Algorithm gives us for let's say three of those panels. We go through manually count three of those panels and figure out by how much they're off, and we just correct them. And we use that correction factor to correct all the rest of the data from all the rest of the videos that we recorded on our phone. So hopefully that makes sense. So in analyzing our data, what we did is we randomly subsampled the manual counts. Let's say there was 100 panels that were manually counted. We would choose 20 of them. We took those 20 and we tried and we came up with an average number of clusters per panel, panel using the manual count, which is like this number here. We also took the same 20 and we decided to use them as calibration data for our smartphones so we can calibrate all of the video data. And so what we're trying to figure out is like, which is best? Just counting a manual um, set by itself and using that as an average or counting a manual subset and then calibrating the videos and then using the videos to solve something. Um, and what we did was we did that like a couple thousand times because um, I had, we had counted the entire vineyard by hand. So I randomly chose a subsample, um, just uh, arbitrarily a large number of times. And each time we're gonna get a prediction from the manual method and a prediction from the automated method. And sometimes it'll be accurate, sometimes it'll be off. It really depends on which uh, grapevine you use to calibrate. Um, and, but I plotted the distribution, I'll show you. I plotted those, um, distributions of error uh, here. And so um, on the left side, we've got like our automated uh, automated estimations. And then on the right side, we've got the manual estimations. And what's important to note here is that, um, that both, both methods are prone to error, right? And there are times when like, you wanna be as close to zero as possible, basically. That means you've estimated the total vineyard yield accurately. There are times when, you know, a certain percentage of the time, the manual method did get it exactly right. Uh, but on average, you can see that the automated methods, they reduce your range of error pretty tremendously, right? And so like, you got like the worst case error, you know, uh, over here, you know, this ranges from negative 20% to over 30%. Imagine just being 30% off in a worst case situation, right? Using that same data in your smartphone, you can actually reduce the absolute worst case error to less than 20%, right? So um, a 
hopefully this makes sense. The idea is we want to like mitigate how wrong we can be by augmenting our manual counts with these smartphone uh, counts. And uh, we also did it with sheep. Uh, I guess I guess what we found is that in general, like trying to count the number of clusters directly using the phone ends up per outperforming um, all of the rest of the, the methods. So I'm going to just show you this table. There's a lot of stuff in here. I threw it in here just for uh, just to, just to be uh, thorough. But the important things are right here. Like uh, like you can see compare these numbers directly. This is like the mean absolute error. This is like what percentage off of the total yield for each of these methods. And we reduced our on average we reduced our error by about two percent. Um, which which uh, this is in 2020. Now, if you remember back to the graph of manual counts, the person who counted manually in 2020 actually did a really good job, but we were still able to edge them out by about 2%, right? If you look at uh, 2019, where the manual counts were kind of all over the place, our, our margins were a lot higher, right? They, they were the two different patterns were, you know, were at 8.5 and 6%, but we knocked that down to 3%, right? So, um, one of the important takeaways is like, Yes, we do better on average over the when you look at the whole thing, but um, we also do better on like a vine by vine basis. So, for example, if you're manually counting the vineyard and you manually count half of your vines 20% over and the other half of your vines 20% under, you're going to average out to 0% less, right? Um, but in reality, you were 20% off the entire time. You just kind of got lucky that you averaged out correctly, right? What this automated method does is because we're because we're imaging the entire block of grapes, um, our error on a vine by vine basis, which are kind of represented by the mean RMS and the, the mean um, absolute error columns here, our error on a vine by vine basis ends up being um, much smaller, right? So basically, what I'm trying to say is like we can better capture the variance on a vine by vine basis throughout the vineyard than a simple mean or a simple average could. Uh, and that's what makes this technique um, just better than, than uh, what farmers have been doing basically ever since they started trying to estimate yield. So hopefully, this makes sense. Um, so there's a couple important things to think about here. The first is that, like I said before, as your vineyard gets bigger, if you're trying to do this manually, you're going to have to keep counting a larger and larger area. However, with our method, um, all you have to do is like record more of the, like a larger vineyard, which is pretty easy to do, especially if you're driving through the vineyard anyways to fertilize or spray pesticides. You just kind of put your phone out there, and the phone will do all of the work, and you can only count a small section of the vines to calibrate instead of having to. Um, keep count like uh, keep counting a larger and larger section if your vineyard gets get bigger, right? So um, just to sort of illustrate that, this red section here, this is like the this is like the, the um, sort of the error band using the automated method when we only use twenty channels for calibration, and then these bars here are like the number of channels we use to estimate using a manual um, method, and so. What, what you can see is that it takes about it takes about 50 panels using the traditional method to estimate to get the same accuracy as when we use 20 panels, right? 50 panels versus 20 panels, it doesn't seem like a lot. But we did like less than an acre in this experiment, right? Uh, when you consider the fact that it takes about, if you're really good and really fast, it takes about 15 minutes for a panel um, to count them manually. And you consider that there are about 160 instances of panels per acre, depending on the variety. And the average vineyard size in the Finger Lakes is 40 acres. Um, this time difference, uh, you can actually get like 100%, uh, sorry, 100 times decrease in the amount of labor needed to get the same estimation in your accuracy. So um, hopefully this makes sense. The idea is that, like, for what we're doing, just like a very, like, less than an acre. The differences were noticeable, but as you try and scale this up to a larger and larger vineyard, um, your cost savings grow like exponentially, right? As opposed to just sort of like the same percentage. So um, that's like that's the 
the main hope is that like we can uh, we can create a tool right that that allows farmers to uh, get better yield estimates with a lot less effort than they would have otherwise needed to do. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. Do you guys have any questions? I'm trying to remember what's next. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions before I move on? Oh, you said that uh, Oh, I'm doing great. I tried to, I thought I was going to go over, so I spoke as fast as I could, but um, yeah. All right, no, no questions. I really like the innovative devices and the algorithm. Good. Uh, I have a question. So you mentioned there are some alternative TV methods which cost really a lot. And what do you think, what is the difference between your methods like in terms of algorithm or devices? Like what is the different structure? Yeah, so the main, um, the main other uh, uh, researcher, his name is escaping my mind, who, who does yield prediction in vineyards. He started at Cornell, moved down to Carnegie Mellon. Um, I've seen his mechanism. Uh, the camera itself um, is massive, and uh, it's a very, um, very expensive, uh, scary, like 3D camera that uses like backscattering of X rays. Um, and like you need this huge uh, metal mechanism to like properly mount it to a tractor. Uh, uh, it's just huge and expensive, and uh, you'd have a hard time finding a vineyard manager who would want to spend twelve thousand dollars on a piece of equipment like that. So you have a twelve thousand dollar piece of equipment hanging off the front of the tractor um, so that they can improve their yield estimates. Um, so like that's sort of the biggest thing. So, yeah, their algorithms are more advanced because they're doing full 3D reconstruction. Um, they're they're using X-ray backscattering um, and their uh, GPS integration, and they're kind of like generating these 3D uh, images of the vines, uh, which is like a much more basic, simpler approach because we're not trying to create the best and the brightest and the fastest, right? We're trying to create something that farmers are actually going to want to use, right? And will actually help them today. Right. Uh, I could I could pull my phone out. Uh, it's a little late in the season now, but three months ago I could pull my phone out, drive through the vineyard, and uh, I don't need a twelve thousand dollar piece of equipment. So from an algorithm and hardware standpoint, it's just a lot simpler. Um, uh, but or from a usability standpoint, it's much more expensive. That's a great question. So I actually, I knew I was forgetting to put something about presentation. We actually have a suite who's currently working on building a smartphone app uh, to, to uh, I mean, I just pulled my phone out, used the camera app on my phone. Um, so it's not hard at all, but we're kind of creating an app that um, will also integrate uh, GPS location. So that the farmers not only know what the yield is, but they can have a heat map of the yield to figure out exactly where the yield is in the uh, which can help with fertilizing and things like that. And then uh, um, the idea is that it'll be connected to like a cloud-based backend. Uh, we're also looking at possibly other routes of commercialization. Um, you know, there, there have been a few companies that have reached out that are interested in licensing. Um, so we're kind of in that process of like working to get it out to the farmers. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, everything I wrote is in Python, uh, and I use TensorFlow for the. So I don't know. I guess I, I wasn't clear about this, but the video processing does not happen on sub in real time. It happens. Uh, I, I can load the videos onto my computer, hit a button, software processes them, output you can batch process video files, and outputs an Excel file with the, the name of the video file and how many great clusters are found in that video. Um, now I wrote it in Python because. Uh, I wanted to do it quickly, and I use off the shelf uh, neural networks because uh, pre trained neural networks because I wanted to minimize the amount of training data I needed to generate to help it detect great clusters. But if you wanted to commercialize this, um, you could, especially with modern smartphones that have chips that are, that are optimized for neural network computation, you probably would, with a with good deal of effort, could make this run on a phone. Um, or at the very least, to make it just substantially more efficient from a computer standpoint. Um, 
this is the type of thing that you can process for a few dollars on a cloud computer. You know, we would process your entire thing with your but you know, and that's sort of order of magnitude for uh, uh and it's just about the same thing. TensorFlow. TensorFlow is Google's um, open source neural network platform. Okay, so you try a test at all in terms of like what you can do? Great question. That's a very good question. Um, so the answer is we didn't we didn't research that extensively, but we did do this um, 2020. The 2020 data was performed on two different um, Varieties, Riesling and Pinot Noir, and I, I ran some experiments where I, I I I measured the performance of a neural network trained on Riesling data on videos from Pinot Noir to see like do I need more training data in order to get this to work on a different variety? And the answer is no. Uh, we're we are taking videos so early in the season that pretty much every variety looks. All of the great clusters in the same shade of green, and they're all about the size of my crop. So, like, that's one of the advantages here. Is like, uh, like I said, we haven't tested this thoroughly, but like from the from the bit of uh, investigating that we've done so far, it seems rather not stick to at least the great varieties that uh, we tend to grow up here in upstate New York. That being said, expanding it to other great varieties um, could just be uh, creating a bit more training data for the neural network. Um, there might be some issues with occlusion and other varieties that we aren't dealing with in these, but uh, but yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, so, you, from what I can tell, you both won past the mix of images in one hand. Can you go back and then another pass in the other side? Can you pass the image? Um, so, I imaged both sides of the vine just to compare them. and. Uh, when you're calibrating the data using manual counts, you don't actually need both sides. Um, you might get a slightly better estimate if you take both sides and average them or something like that. But uh, this stuff, I think I just use like the uh, east facing side of the vine. I want to take a step back. So, you mentioned that you have the videos is taken so early in the season, but they the the, the precipitation or rainfall variation from here is that is really occurs in the middle of the season, right? Yeah. So, how that to factor because the, the initial motivation is the early season prediction of the video, right? But uh, because your, your video is taking so early that the weather variation for here will not really influence that. So, how that weather information influencing the terms in your yield equation? That's probably the other term, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a very good point. Uh, the final weight of the great cluster is most affected by the amount of rainfall during the sun. That being said, the overall size of the vine um, is going to be affected by like the moisture level early on in the year. So, like winter snowfall, um, water absorption in like April, uh, you know, March, April, that period of time is going to affect basically like uh, how many, how many, uh, uh, how many shoots. To grow up, and then, like I said, uh, 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 like the uh, the number of shoots. Uh, the number of shoots in so a healthy year with a lot of rainfall. What they do, these shoots or, or these canes are actually last year's shoots from the inside of the vine. Hopefully that makes sense. They choose like the four best shoots near the center of the vine. They cut everything up up. They take those shoots, they lay them down as canes. If you've got a lot of rainfall in a given year, um, you're gonna have really big healthy shoots in the middle of the vine. Those are going to make for really good canes the following year. Does that make sense? So, and then remember the shoots grow Next year's shoots grow directly off the canes. If you go to the clusters, throw off the shoots. If you only have two canes here instead of four, you're going to have to yield on that vine. So, um, so like the rainfall from one year can actually affect how many canes you're going to have on your vine the next year, which uh, which severely impacts the amount of yield you have on that particular uh, 
um, that particular bias. Does that make sense? Kind of answer your question. So, like, uh, some of it's like early season rainfall, uh, but a lot of it's like last year's rainfall. Uh, you know, uh, and like, and like, how many canes you're going to end up with? Um, things like that. There's a lot of factors. Um, yeah. I have a question. Can you go to the next slide? So, how the rainfall influence like the W trend? Is that the that means if the current year's rainfall influence the W trend, but the previous year's rainfall influence the end? Is that correct? So, so um, yeah, the current year's rainfall during the summer mostly impacts this. The rainfall of the current year prior to um, prior to uh, like the grid cluster developing will affect this number for the current year, but this number is going to be most affected by how many canes there are left over from the previous year. So um, it's it's a bit of both, although if that makes sense. So the rainfall kind of early in the current growing season is going to affect the number of grape clusters, but it's also the number of grape clusters is also affected by last year's rainfall. This term is what's mostly affected by um, the current year's rainfall, but this term is affected a little bit too. So. Yeah, because you know, earlier later um, analysis you show uh, your automated approach versus manual approach, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the comparison was based on yield. So in that case, the current year rainfall, the W should be comparable, right? But the, 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 another analysis you only look at the um, the, the, the total count. So the the comparison wasn't against yield. The comparison was against the number of grape clusters counted during the harvest. Okay. And so we weren't comparing it against the wheat. Okay. We were actually what we did was we attempted to calculate this number in the beginning of the season, and then we precisely counted this number when we were harvesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so so yeah, we didn't we didn't at any point compare our estimates for this against against uh, the whole term, but rather during the harvest process, we went through and manually counted the number of grape clusters during the harvest process um, and came up with a, a more accurate count for this number. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I want to follow up on that issue. There's a slide where you show the relationship between count and the yield, so we have a one regression line. Oh, no, there were four. There were four. Uh, four graphs all at once. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. I, I don't know, maybe I'm confused because in, we normally in science, we put the predictor value of the variable as the, as the x axis and the response variable as the y axis. So the, the response variable is the actual yield, right? So, so the, the count which you have on the y-axis is your count with your vision system. Uh, the the, the y-axis is the count with the vision system. Right. The, okay. The x-axis is like the ground truth. It's not a response as much as it is a graph, uh, an estimate against the truth. Okay. Does that make sense? So like. The idea is that if our estimate was perfect, all of the dots would be in a perfectly straight diagonal. Right. But if you, so when you look at, say, the, the bottom graph there, let's say, your, your counts have you range from, let's say, 30 to 50, you know, more well, or less. I can actually explain this to you. Yeah. Uh, in what year? 2020. Somebody, uh, we hired a grad student to go through and take videos. I didn't take videos myself this particular year. I hired a grad student to go through and take videos. And when he took video, um, he got really close to the vine and he cut off in the frame all the tops of the shoots. And so the, uh, the algorithm wasn't actually able to detect any of the tips of the shoots in those videos from that year. That's why this line was so flat. Um, Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a huge range in the actual and a very narrow one in the yeah. in the uh, uh, in the count with the, the division. That's why we ended up going with this uh, with counting the closest to the record. Um, it just like you said, uh, um, this doesn't quite capture the variance quite as well as. as, as um, am, I, am I correct that the 
might be worth following up on this. So you were talking about the app. Um, one reason for the app is to give farmers an easy way to record these videos. And another reason for the app is to give them feedback as they're recording. So we actually try having other people uh, record data like this in the document. Um, and we found that even though we felt like we gave these very, very clear instructions and it's very, very simple, we're still making some mistakes. Like they would take it slightly too early, it wasn't dark in the background, like everything was closed, just like here. And so what we're hoping the app can do is give them feedback directly and say, like, actually, it's too late. Don't go back. Like, so like just making up this case before, before they put up the Um, given the, uh, the importance of clustered process and the fact that it responds to web, I would think you'd be very interested in using the same system for estimating cluster size. Is there a reason you have to tackle that, or is there, or are you in process? So, the reason we have to tackle that is because there are a lot of people who have tackled it. I, I don't think we have any plans to sort of go down that route. Um, it, it, uh, there are people who have, who have, who have um, solved that problem. problem. And um, some, some of the papers I've seen didn't require the model all the means because later in the season, when the grid cluster counts on the rain, um, the canopy, the leaf canopy is much more dense. It's actually a lot harder to see it. So we basically just said, like, where is there room for improvement? And we kind of focused in our research on that number of clusters term and, and kind of left the other terms to whatever method the grower chooses or let other people who, who are currently researching that. So, just so we can get to understand. Um, so, that is a variable. Uh, it isn't something that is rather constant. It's a variable and Frankly, it's, it's not an insignificant variable, like it's important. It's, a, it's at least, I mean, it's half the term. And there's, there is a, a bit of variance, like there's a good bit of variance in that term. Um, but we just decided to solve the other problem. Yeah. Just a clarification, when you're manually counting the number of clusters, is that going to get early season or is that going to late when you're opening it? So when we manually count them, we do it at the same time we do the imaging in June. These, these counts down here are done manually too, but they're done during the harvest process. Um, I think I'm out of time. I, I do have one or two more slides just to sort of show where we're trying to take this stuff next. Uh, we're looking at um, kind of building a revised model of the clusters. Um, we're looking at using Alstom's clustering model. Um, we're looking at using Alstom's clustering model. 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 We're looking at using Alstom's clustering these guys right here, and they turn them into next year's teams, which are those guys right there. Um, and so the way we're doing that is um, I tried using some uh, LIDAR and um, trying to make progress on that front. That being said, LIDAR is a relatively new technology um, that's just now getting put on people's smartphones. Um, and so I was like, well, let's back up and see if I can come up with something that um, is simpler. So I just took some like cheap $5 lasers that I found on Amazon, strapped them into a smartphone holder, and I kind of used some um, uh, structured light type stuff. Um, these are what the videos look like, just like dots, right? And I was actually able to generate a pretty good scan of, um, of like the vines during the pruning process. The idea is we'll use this to estimate pruning weight, which informs the Ravaz index, which can inform pruning techniques. Um, and lastly, uh, this same idea of like object detection and tracking, I'm actually implementing um, on another project studying honeybees. Pollinators are very important to agriculture. So we're trying to understand honeybee behavior. And um, so I'm working with an entomologist uh, in our lab, uh, Dave, Dave Peters, to, to come up with a way to help study animals, uh, to help study uh, honeybees. Um, but uh, the, the main goal of this project is ultimately to create like a uh, abstract uh, framework for detection and tracking um, so that people can use it for animals, honeybees, insects, grape clusters, anything that they want. So that's sort of um, where my, my research is going in the future. And uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to say thank you for listening. Uh, very intently. It was great presenting to you guys. And you asked some really phenomenal questions. So thank you. And yeah, have a good day.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.